You know, sometimes one has to say things that one doesn't say with an easy, easy feeling upon the heart. But sometimes things have to be said anyway. I've titled this lecture The Final Conflict. And the reason why I've titled it The Final Conflict, because that's exactly what it's about. As Seventh-day Adventists, we have always believed and we have preached that the very final issue will revolve around what? The Sabbath. The very final issue will be the Sabbath. And we have preached that in the end there will be two groups. Those that belong to the group that keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus and those that have been united in twin eras of spiritualism, there is no death and the sanctification of Sunday. And whenever one preaches this message, people say, but that's impossible. How are you going to get everybody together? There are many groups. There are not just two groups. You will never be able to get them together. So in these last few presentations that we've had, We've seen that behind the scenes, the story is different. We read in the spirit of prophecy, eight manuscripts release God's presentation of the detestable works of the inhabitants of the ruling powers of the world who bind themselves into secret societies and confederacies not honoring the law of God should enable the people who have the light of truth to keep clear of all these evils. More and more will all false religionists of the world manifest their evil doings. Now, brothers and sisters, I'm not being judgmental when I expose error in the world out there. I'm not against Catholics. I love Catholics. I'm an evangelist. All I want to do is reach souls. I'm not against Protestants. I'm not against Muslims. I'm not against anything, but I'm against error. Cloaked in the robe of truth. Will all false religionists of the world manifest their evil doings for? There are but how many parties? Two parties. Those who keep the commandments of God and those who wear war against God's holy law. There are only two. There aren't a hundred. There aren't even three. There are only two. And in the end, the final decisions will boil down to this very fact. We have preached that the mark of the beast will be implemented, that Sabbath will be the final issue around which all of these things will evolve. Isn't that salvation by works? No, it's righteousness by faith. Because I believe that God's righteousness is a gift. I concur with everything that I heard here, every single statement. But I also believe that if God's character of love is a transcript of the law, then that is the character that He would like us to develop through His grace. So there will be two parties. Now, what they want is unity. Unity on their terms. This was when the Pope was in St. Louis and all the nations symbolically came and bowed down to him. This is what they said, this is how they performed it, and this is what happened. It was great. A great feeling of it was a great excitement, great peace. of peace, unity. of love. Peace, love, and unity. Unity. Yes. unity. Yes. Symbolically, all the nations bowed down to Pope John Paul II, and he blessed them. While the choir sang, and all the nations will come and bow down before you, O Lord. And all the world, in every corner, they sang.
and all the world in every corner. We have been preaching for over 150 years that God's people will become prominent and that amongst all the peoples of the world, the final attention will be upon this people. And nobody can seem to understand how it will all come together. A distinct people with a testing message, the Lord has been pleased to give His people the third angel's message. As a testing message to bear to the world, John beholds a people distinct and separate from the world. I'm not talking about sitting in a monastery. I know we are in the world, but that doesn't mean that we conform to the standards of the world. We are a light unto the world. Who refuse to worship the beast or his image, who bear God's sign, keeping holy his Sabbath, the seventh day, to be kept holy as a memorial of the living God, the creator of heaven and earth. Of them the apostle writes, here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Doesn't negate the fact that this is the issue. Now why the Sabbath? These people have a distinct message of separation. Come out of her, my people. That doesn't mean we don't accept the individual people, but we do not accept false worship. And we stand for righteousness. That you be not partakers of her sins and that you receive not of her plagues. Come out from among them. Be separate, says the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. God wants to separate a people who will stand for righteousness. And the law is a transcript of his character, which is righteousness. Revelation 14, 9, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in the forehead on his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. The smoke of their torment ascendeth forever and ever, and have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. This is the hardest message in the world to give. And it is righteousness by faith in verity. Because if you acknowledge God as king and acknowledge his government and acknowledge his law, you are saying, I want to be subject to the sanctifying power of God. This is not works. This is gratefulness. If you love me, keep my commandments. If we love God with all of our hearts and all of our minds, we will be thankful Sinners saved by grace. Sunday is purely a creation of the Catholic Church, American Catholic Court Lay. Sunday is a law of the Catholic Church alone, American Sentinel. June 1893, the observance of Sunday by Protestants is an homage they pay in spite of themselves to the authority of the Catholic Church. The Sabbath has nothing to do with the day. That's incidental. The Sabbath has to do with authority. Jesuit Catechism. What if the Scriptures command one thing and the Pope another contrary? The Holy Scriptures must be thrown aside. What is the Pope? He's the vicar of Christ, King of kings, Lord of lords. There is but one judgment seat belonging to God and the Pope. Jesus is sidelined in this equation. My word is a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. Man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord is sidelined. Here is an arrogant power that takes the place of Jesus Christ. So arrogant that in 1969 in this quote they write, Not the creator of the universe in Genesis 2, 1 to 3, but the Catholic Church can claim the honor of having granted man a pause to his work every seven days. That's straight talk. That's straight talk. And then the Catholic Mirror, 1893, we'll talk about this document. Reason and common sense demand the acceptance of one or the other of these alternatives. Either Protestantism and the keeping holy of Saturday, or Catholicity and the keeping holy of Sunday compromise is impossible. 
Rome says compromise is impossible. The Lord says compromise is impossible. Jesus Christ the same yesterday and forever. I do not alter what has gone out of my mouth. So here is an impasse. Why the Sabbath? Sunday is an offspring and the acknowledged offspring of the Catholic Church, a spouse of the Holy Ghost without a word of remonstrance from the Protestants. And you may read your Bible from Genesis to Revelation and you'll not find a single line authorizing the sanctification of Sunday. The Scriptures enforce the religion's observance of Saturday, a day we never sanctify. They're very blatant statements. They cannot be gainsaid. They're not judgmental. They're facts. They're just plain facts. Now, why is the Sabbath so important? Well, let's read it. Of course, the Catholic Church claims that the change was her act, and the act is a mock of her ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matters. You see, the Sabbath is a symbol of God's authority. It is a sign. Hebrew, it is a sign, which means a mark, a distinguishing mark, a bar banner that you hold up. For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and then that in the is, and rested on the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So God placed his seal, we know that, in the heart of the Ten Commandments, which gives the entire law its authority. Without a seal, a governmental seal saying who the lawmaker is and what the territory is, the law has no validity. So the Sabbath commandment gives the validity to the entire law of God. Without the Sabbath commandment, the law could have been given by Joe Blow. Anybody. And we need not be intimidated or bowed down to its precepts. But with the Sabbath commandment, it is the Lord thy God the creator that gave the law. It's my seal of authority. So I have to do nothing but keep the Sabbath and I am acknowledging an authority over my life that cannot be gainsaid because it's from the creator and the recreator. I stand for righteousness by faith if I love him enough to keep his commandments. That's the bottom line. So is the Sabbath going to be the issue? Well, what is Satan attacking in the government of heaven? It's the authority of Jesus Christ. And here is the symbol of his authority. If he wants to attack the authority of Jesus Christ, he has no option but to attack the Sabbath. You know, I always used to think if I were the devil, and it says there in the Bible that I'm going to attack the Sabbath... I would attack something else and prove God wrong. You know, I'd be sneaky. But I can't. Because the Sabbath stands for God's authority. Whose authority is relevant in my life? Either it's God's or it's someone else's. You see, Sunday is a mark of what? Our authority. It's got nothing to do with the day. The day is incidental. I always explain it like this. If my wife were to divorce me and marry some ugly buckhead and <laughs> rabbit tooth guy out there, and this man says, I am the new authority in the lives of your children, and the, and the law says that I have visitations on whatever day, and uh, that's the day that I can get off from work or whatever, and this man says, no, I'm the new authority. You can't have that, have that day with your dad. You must choose another day. Then I'm going to take umbrance. I'm going to be very angry. Why? Because I can't have that day or because he's usurping the authority. It's about authority. It's not about the day. The day is incidental. So it is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible and this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact, the Catholic record. All Adventists know these texts. So I must not bow down to this authority and neither must I bow down to the image. And the image of the beast is when the wall of separation between church and state fall apart and Protestantism 
does the same enforcing of false doctrine as Rome once did. That's the image. Simple. So Justice Chief Rehnquist said the wall of separation between church and state is a metaphor based on bad history. That is the image being formed. Billy Graham writes in his own autobiography that he was instrumental in getting Ronald Reagan to appoint ambassadors to the Vatican. This is the image of the beast forming. I may not bow down to that because it still enforces the same mark of authority that the previous one did. In fact, on Larry King Live, after Pope John Paul's death, on the 2nd of April 2005, the same day, Billy Graham declared that the Pope is the moral leader of the world. This is the image of the beast. I'm not being judgmental. I'm quoting. Now let's have a look at the funeral and the subsequent events. And is it possible that Seventh Day Adventists have been preaching the truth all along? Is it possible? Here is the funeral. Here lies the Pope in state. He is instrumental in bringing the whole world back to the feet of Catholicism. And millions and millions of people were intrigued and watched this event. The BBC said, quote, 2nd of April 2005, the Pope was the only one to be a world evangelist. He could visit all faiths, Islam and Judaism. He prepared, prepared the way for a religious New world order. End of quote. That's an amazing statement, isn't it? He prepared the way. Are we heading for those final events that we have been talking about? Today I want to show you something that might surprise you. We have been preaching this message for over 150 years, often with scorn attached to it, and ridicule and incredulity. But I want to show you the message as it evolved in Roman Catholicism. Because Rome has exactly the same message, just from a different perspective. And let us see if these two will dovetail and eventually there will only be two groups. Those that align themselves with the system and those that keep the commandments of God. Starting July 1973, a man by the name of Father Gobi began to write down interior locutions, that's dictated messengers, which he received from Mary to deliver to the priests, Our Lady's beloved sons. And the message basically say, be faithful to the Pope, total obedience to his commands, or ready to fight even to the shedding of blood in order to remain united to him and faithful to the gospel. The Bible says... Be faithful to the Lord Jesus, total obedience to his commands, ready to die for your faith. Right or wrong? That's what it says. How accepted is Father Gobi? Here he is, together with Pope John Paul II, highly respected um, visionary in the Roman Catholic Church. On May 13, 1991, he revealed to Father Gobi, my Pope, John Paul II, and I, this is a, regarding the message of Fatima. I confirm for you as the Pope of my secret. The Pope about whom I spoke to the children during the apparitions. The Pope of my love and my sorrow. When this Pope will have completed the task which Jesus has entrusted to him. And I will come down from heaven to receive his sacrifice. All of you will be cloaked in dense darkness of apostasy which will then become general. So she said, this is the Pope of the Fatima secret. This is the one. And this is fascinating. I all world, April 15, 2005, Vatican City. Shortly before his last trip to hospital, Pope John Paul II warned of dark shadows developing humanity. In our day, human society appears to be shrouded in dark shadows while it is shaken by tragic events and shattered by catastrophic natural disasters. The Pope wrote in, a, wrote in a message for the Roman Catholic World Day of Missions. So just as Mary said, the final darkness will have to lead people to an acceptance of this light. And we are heading for events which we do not understand or ever will comprehend. The Bible says there will be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation upon the earth. 
Was this Pope accepted by the world? Did they wonder after him? Yes, every political leader in the world, every king, queen paid homage to this great event. This is the first time in human history where you can find three United States presidents kneeling before the Pope. And the Bible says that the second beast will pay homage to the first beast. Who's paying homage to whom here? Did you know not even the Roman Catholic presidents attended the funerals of previous popes? This is the first time in history. And then a new pope is elected. We have a pope, Bento, Pope Benedict XVI. And the world hails a new man who takes smoothly the office of power and moves on to a history of certain future. Ratzinger becomes Pope Benedict XVI. Now, what can we expect? I'd like you to notice the date. The Edmonton Journal, Thursday, July 28, 2005. That's yesterday's newspaper. The unity theme. Pope Benedict preaches unity during the papacy's first hundred days. Unity, unity, unity. Unity in what? Unity in truth or unity in error? It has to be error. It cannot be unity in truth. And does he ob obtain the acclamation of the religious world of the today? Absolutely. Here they are. Arraigned all religions in the world before this new pope. This is Osservatore Romano, the official newspaper of Roman Catholicism. World religious leaders applaud to Pope Benedict XVI during a meeting in Sala Clementina at the Vatican. Nothing has changed. There is no dip in relations. It continues as before. Now, who is Pope Benedict? Well, he was known as the keeper of the straight and narrow. He was the head of the Congregation for Doctrine and Faith, which by all writers is acknowledged to be exactly the same of, as the Inquisition. So the head of the Inquisition is now the reigning Pope. The Inquisition, heresy, deciding for oneself what one shall believe. Heresis, choice. There is the Inquisition. The Catholic Church is a respecter of conscience and of liberty. Nevertheless, when confronted by heresy, deciding for oneself what one wants to believe, she has recourse to force, to corporal punishment, to torture. She lit in Italy the funeral piles, piles of the Inquisition. This is history. I'm just quoting history. Now, it's very interesting to me who is appointed in his place to take up the office of the Holy Inquisition. Well, here it is. 15-5-2005. Benedict selects an American as defender of church doctrine. I'll be spokesman for the church in the United States at the significant and high levels of the Vatican and the Holy See. That I hope will be helpful in creating a better awareness of our needs and issues and vice versa. San Francisco Archbishop William Levada. So, the Bible says that the second beast will pay homage to the first beast, and now we have the first beast being ruled by a former head of the Inquisition, and the second beast's representative appointed to the head of the Inquisition. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that just, just an interesting coincidence? He saw the ideas connected to a destruction of the order that came before. He is the maintainer of church doctrine. It is Ratzinger who wrote, Other churches are no sisters of ours, the Vatican insists. That was in 2000. It must always be clear that the one holy, Catholic, and apostolic universal church is not the sister but the mother of all the churches. He's the one who said, Rome never changes, the children must change. According to U.S. World Report 1997, Ratzinger warned, quote, that the use of scripture to evaluate church teaching was one of the most dangerous currents to flow out of the Vatican, out of Vatican II. So the scripture, still to this day, is not paramount 
tradition. So the war is more than just the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a symbol of the Word of God versus tradition. Who do I believe? God or tradition? The theologian Karl Rana, the Jesuit, has pointed out that we are moved much more readily and effective by those divine interventions which we call apparitions than by abstract teachings of knowledgeable theologians or the hierarchy of the church. So apparitions versus the Word of God. Seventh-day Adventists base their arguments on what? On the Word of God. Their arguments will be based on apparitions because they do not have the Word of God. Where do the apparitions come from? Mary. Here are Dave Hunt's statements of worship of Mary or acknowledgement of Mary. Mary is called the gate of heaven. Jesus is the only door. There's no other. Because no one can enter that blessed kingdom without passing through her. The way to salvation is open to none other than to Mary. So she takes the place of Jesus Christ and is a representation of salvation by man through man with the exclusion of the divine component, Jesus Christ. So in the occult world, this is salvation by self, salvation by man. That's why you have the symbols of masonry right there. The veneration of Mary was put back on the map by people such as John Paul II and Mother Teresa. Here he is in the cave. They always come out of the cave. Public veneration. The Thunder of Justice Forward was written by Malachi Martin. Now that's a prominent individual. He says, only a very distracted and unaware Christian of today could, avoid, could have avoided receiving at least a fleeting impression by the Lord Tom Hawk Summer that for a number of years now there has been a steady build-up of events. In the broadest sense of the world, of the world, all of which indicate that humanity as a whole and the Roman Catholic Church in particular have reached a fateful threshold beyond which lies a new condition of human affairs. Visions, apparitions, messages, predictions, little children telling the future, nationwide publicity tours, the singular role of the Blessed Virgin Mary of Nazareth as Queen of Heaven, Mother of all the living, and not surprisingly, the mediatrix of all graces is pervasive. So here is a mediator, fallen man, mediating on behalf of fallen man, salvation by the God-men themselves. This is the message in a nutshell. But such exultancy is soberly contrasted with the other side of the century's carnage. And then it talks about industrial slaughter and all the ripples and infanticides and the terrible things that are happening in the world and the darkness of the world natural disasters, all of these. And it resembles George Orwell's portrait of a big brother. That's Malachi Martin writing. So the world is coming to a point of decision. Now, what is the point of decision? Here, the Lady of All Nations predicted a final Marian dogma proclaiming Our Lady co-redemptrix, mediatrix, and advocate, taking the place of Jesus Christ. And here in this quote it says, Cardinal Ratzinger, that's the present Pope, reportedly has written to the visionaries that there is no theological barrier to the possible proclamation of the dogma. So Mariology is just as part and part of this Pope as it was of the previous one. There's no change. Fatima was the most significant apparition for the early part of the 20th century. Majigore is meeting the spiritual needs of this generation. His eminence, Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger, has stated in the Karatzinger report, one of the signs of our times is that the announcement of the Marian apparitions are multiplying over the world. So the present Pope is saying, look at the Marian apparitions. Where are we heading? The Seventh-day Adventist Church has said, look at the word. Where are we heading? Well, what does the apparition say? <coughs> the woman Eve had a decisive role in the fall of mankind through her disobedience to God and desire to exalt herself. The woman Mary has a decisive role in the salvation of mankind through her obedience to God. Now, if ever there was salvation by works, then that's it, right or wrong. 
But we don't have a salvation by works message. We have a salvation by grace message. We are saved by faith and that through Jesus Christ. And because he saves us, we love him and keep his commandments by his grace. Just in case I misunderstood. Pope Paul VI in 1967, signal, signal Magnum Encyclical said that the Lady of Fatima was the Virgin of Revelation. Okay, so we have two groups preaching a Revelation message. The one is the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and the other one is the Roman Catholic Church. The one focuses on Mary and salvation by man through man. The other one focuses on Jesus Christ and salvation by grace. So let's go to Fatima, which is the most significant of all these modern apparitions. What happened at Fatima? This is where they were told that John Paul II was the final one, or would be the final one. Three little children. Lucia, Francisco, and Jacinta. And at the apparition time, Mary, so-called, told Lucia, you will live until the very final events are to be culminated. Fascinating. But Francisco and Jacinta, you will not. These little children died before they were 10 years old under great suffering I don't even want to go there. It is heartbreaking. But Lucia was to live until the final events. At Fatima, the message was the consecration of Russia and the world to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. There was a vision of hell and then the assassination attempt of John Paul II who was the Pope of the vision. Fascinating. Confirmed by Father Gobi. In that church... You have this portrait above the altar, Mary, standing there in the back, the angel of Portugal over there, the bishop of the diocese, the three little children, and in the back, standing over there, you have three popes. Pope Pius, who consecrated, the 12th, who consecrated the world to the Immaculate Heart of Mary in 1942. Then you have Pope John the 23rd who opened it up to the entire world through the Vatican II Council, and Pope Paul VI, who is the inside initiate into this new world religion. This is a fascinating picture. This is a mighty place, Fatima, with millions of tourists coming there. Look at the architecture of the structure with this symbol. The building is basically pagan and Masonic. Here you have the Temple of Bel in ancient times and Bacchus. And in Fatima, you have the relief of the Father and the Son crowning Mary, Queen of Heaven. Everywhere at Fatima, you will find this relief. Inside, there are three graves. You have the little grave of Francisco. He's buried there. And you have the grave of Jacinto. She's buried there. And here is a grave that's open. And it's waiting for the body of someone. Who's that? That's Sister Lucia. Now what happened to Sister Lucia? Is she still alive? No. She died. She's now lying in her monastery and at the end of this year she will be placed in that tomb. And this vision said that when she dies all things will come to an end. I don't believe the devil's prophecies. So don't think that I'm quoting him as a prophet here. I'm just saying from a Catholic perspective, there has to be some dovetailing if we're going to meet with this final event. Here is Sister Lucia with Pope John Paul II. Uh, Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger is the one who reported the secret that it concerned Paul, John Paul II, that the shooting happened on the 13th of May the same day as the first vision of Fatima. There it is written out in our whole own hand, the original text of the third Fatima secret, which was released by Cardinal Ratzinger. It's interesting that she also said that after Pope John Paul II, there would be a Pope who rules for just a short time and then the Pope of the final events. 
But it can't go very wrong. He's very old, Cardinal Ratzinger. This is a very interesting thing. Newsweek, 28 February, the Pope's pain. Many Catholics see the Pope suffering as something like the agony of Jesus himself. And neither John Paul II nor those around him discourage such comparisons. You see, he's the one who takes the place of Jesus Christ. The number 13 is an occult number. And Fatima is steeped in the number 13. The vision took place on the 13th of May, 1917. Sister Lucia visited Fatima on the 13th of May, 1946, 67, 82, 91, 2000. The monument to fall to the fall of Berlin Wall was erected and inaugurated on the 13th of August. The assassination of John Paul occurred on the 13th of May. Bishop Correra de Silva declared the apparitions worthy of belief on the 13th of October. Papal visits to Fatima are always on the 13th day. The consecration of Portugal to the Immaculate Heart took place on the 31st of May. In occultism, it doesn't matter whether you use the reverse writing or not. That's also the 13th. And the coming of the Crowning of the Statue of Mary took place on the 13th of May. Francisco and Yusanto were declared blessed on the 13th of the year 2000 by Pope John Paul II. Sister Lucia died on the 13th of February 2005. And Pope John Paul II died on the 2nd of the 4th, 2005, culminating in the number 13 if you add the numbers together. Now this can all be pure chance, or it might not be. Fatima, Garabandal, Medjugorje, all of these, my mother must be accepted. My mother must be heard in her totality of her message. Souls will come to me through the means of her immaculate heart. You either follow this route or you follow the biblical route. That is the choice. This man, Don Bosco, in 1862 had a vision that before the year 2000, the Pope would land the gospel ship between the veneration of the Eucharist which is celebrating the death of Christ, and the veneration of Mary, which is celebrating replacing Jesus with another mediator. And he declared the year 2005, this year, the year of the Eucharist. So if you go to this place, it says over there, at Fatima, now I've just been there, 2005. And then it says, the fifth commandment, thou shalt not kill, the year of the Eucharist. Of course, it's not the fifth commandment, it's the sixth commandment, but you remember they confused because they took one out. Here is the veneration of the host. Here are the people, a huge host at Fatima that can be venerated. Pope John Paul II declared it as such, and he said, during the year of the Eucharist, which runs through October, Catholics can receive special indulgences for the Eucharist adorations and prayer before the Eucharist. So this Pope hasn't moved one inch on doctrine. Marian acknowledgement, here she is on top of this Tower of Babel, using the symbols of uh, the circle within the dot. This represents the Tower of Babel. And Blavatsky, remember, wrote that... Uh, the serpent of Genesis caused daily and hourly the fall of sin of the celestial virgin, which becomes the mother of gods and devils at one at the same time. She's the Holy Ghost, she's Satan in one and the same thing. I talked about this yesterday. The Isis of Jesus had all the titles of Mary. Virgin, Queen of Heaven, we don't go through them all. The Isis of the Hindus has exactly the same titles, Queen of Heaven, Everlasting Virgin, and the Isis of Catholicism is the Queen of Heaven, Virgin Most Chaste, all of these. Blavatsky wrote, When Cyril, the Bishop of Alexandria, had openly embraced the cause of Isis, the Egyptian goddess, and had anthropomorphized her into Mary, the Mother of God, and the Trinitarian controversy had taken place from that moment, the Egyptian doctrine of the emancipation of the creative God out of the Emphet began to be tortured in a thousand ways. So... It is the same as Isis worship. She is the star of the sea. She is the one who is without fault. And she is the one who, according to the Douay Rhymes online Bible, is the one that will crush the serpent's head. She takes the place of Jesus. Salvation by man through man. Salvation by fallen man through fallen man is the message in Mary. Hail Mary! Catholics have long revered her, but now Protestants are finding their own reasons to celebrate the mother of Jesus. 
Isn't that interesting? And the Catholics, Rivera, and now her statue is appearing in all the Protestant world uh, out there. And uh, one after the other is venerating Mary. Except the Southern Baptist theologian, he says he's most exasperated that Mary is held forth as the maternal face of God, some dimension that is fundamentally absent from Scripture. And he says, this is reformation in the reverse. It's simply profoundly unbiblical and leads to the words excesses of Marian devotion. That's a Baptist speaking. Oh, there are observant people in the world out there. Don't underestimate them. The renowned Catholic churchman Fulton Sheen said in 1950, we are living in the days of the apocalypse, the last days of our era, and now take note. The two great forces of the mystical body of Christ and the mystical body of the Antichrist are beginning to draw up their battle lines for the catastrophic contest. So from the view of Rome, there is a battle coming. From the view of Adventism, there is a battle coming. She's the woman of Revelation, the virgin of Revelation. According to, to the biblical doctrine, the virgin of Revelation is Christ developed in his people representing righteousness by faith and obedience to his requirements as a consequence. Right or wrong? So we have a clash. Now, what is the clash going to be about, according to Roman Catholicism? Magicore, another famous approved vision of the Roman Catholic Church. Dear children, today I wish to tell you I am with you in these restless days in which Satan wishes to destroy everything which I and my son Jesus are building up. In a special way, he wishes to destroy your souls. He wishes to guide you as far away as possible from the Christian life as well as from the commandments to which the church is calling you so that you may live them. So we have commandments of the church and we have commandments of God. I am announcing to you that this is the time of the decisive battle. That's what she said at Magigore. We're heading for the time of the decisive battle. Pope Leo had a vision of a confrontation between God and Satan, and Pope Leo was made to understand that Satan would be allowed 100 years to attempt to destroy this church, the Catholic Church. And uh, in the vision, Satan chose the 20th century. He's full of furious activity, for he knows that his time is short. Then they quote, you know, communism and all these things. Now, what is the war according to Catholic apparitions, going to be about? Well, here is the tremendous appearance approved by the church of La Salette, the vision of Mary at La Salette. And here is what she says, quote, If my people do not wish to submit themselves, I am forced to let go of the hand of my son. It is so heavy and weighs me down so much I can no longer keep hold of it. I have suffered all the time for the rest of you. If you do not wish my son to abandon you, I must take it upon myself to pray for this continually. And the rest of you think little of this. In vain you will pray, in vain you will act. You will never be able to make up for the troubles I've taken over for the rest of you. I gave you six days to work. I kept the seventh for myself and no one wishes to grant it to me. This is what weighs down the arm of my son so much. So the Marian apparition said, the Sabbath is the issue. What is the remedy according to Madjagore? This is the place where we see so many of the root causes of our problem. It is the commandment of keeping the Sabbath holy. In the Old Testament you were punished by death concerning the Sabbath. We've lost it through communism and through all of the things today. Both have lost sight, the West and the East, of a Sabbath. And thus our problems have become so large we can no longer even know where to start to find the solution to our ills. So Catholicism is told by Marian apparitions the Sabbath is the problem. Which one? Rome's challenge. Note the date, December 2003. I'm not talking Middle Ages or 1800s anymore. Immaculate Heart. Most Christians assume that Sunday is the biblical approved day of worship. The Roman Catholic Church protests that it transferred Christian worship from the biblical Sabbath to Sunday. And that to try to argue that that change was made in the Bible is both dishonest and note. 
and a denial of Catholic authority, the law of authority. If Protestantism wants to base its teachings on the Bible, it should worship on Saturday. So Rome is telling us clearly which day is their Sabbath. Sunday. Mary Online. Rome's challenge and the Council of Trent issue. This was published in the Catholic Mirror, September 1893, and it occurred in a number of articles and was the official organ of mouthpiece of Cardinal Gibbons and the Vatican in the United States. And in this challenge, why do Protestants keep Sunday? Why did they write this in 1893? And here's the interesting thing. Rome wrote this because on February 24, 1893, the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists adopted a certain resolution appealing to the government and the people of the United States from the decision of the Supreme Court declaring this to be a Christian nation and from the action of Congress in legislating upon the subject of religion. So in answer to a challenge from the Seventh-day Adventist Church, Rome published this document. Now, what did they say? Well, here's the editor's note. The Bible, as interpreted by the church and according to the unanimous consent of the fathers, this was the position and claim of the Catholic Church at the Council of Trent, and this was the main issue in the Council of Trent. So do we believe the Bible, or do we believe tradition? That was the issue in the Council of Trent. And many Catholics were about to accept the Bible and the Bible alone when the Archbishop of Reggio got up in the council. This is written in their document. I'm just quoting. Finally, after long and intensive mental strain, the Archbishop of Reggio came into the council with substantially the following argument to the two parties. Quote, The Protestants who claim to stand upon the written word alone, they profess to hold the scriptures alone as standard of faith, they justify their revolt by the plea that the church has apostatized from the written word. Now the Protestants claim that they stand upon the written word is not true. Their profession of holding the scripture alone as standard of faith is false proof. The written word explicitly enjoins the observance of the seventh day as Sabbath. They do not observe the seventh day but reject it. And he says they have adopted and practiced the observance of Sunday for which they have only tradition of the church. Consequently, the claim of Scripture alone as a standard fails. The doctor of Scripture and of tradition is essential, is fully established, the Protestants themselves being judges. So the Reformation lost at the Council of Trent because of the Sabbath. Archbishop Reggio made his speech at the last opening of the session of Trent. There was no getting around this. The Protestants' own statement of faith, the Augsburg Confession, had clearly admitted that the observation of the Lord's Day had been appointed by the church only. So when the Reformation did not complete the work, God raised up who? The Seventh-day Adventist Church. Now what does Rome have to say about that? This was the inconsistency of the Protestant practice which the Protestant profession they gave to the Catholic Church a long sought and anxiously desired ground upon which to condemn Protestantism. As only a selfishly ambitious rebellion against church authority. If you accept the Sunday, you accept my authority. And this is today the position of the respective parties in this controversy, and upon which he condemns the course of popular Protestantism as being indefensible, self-contradictory, suicidal. What will these Protestants, what will this Protestantism do? Rome writing. Well, Protestants say, how can I see the teachings of this apostate church? Well, you do. You accept our Sabbath. There you are. And those who follow the Bible as their guide, same document. The Israelites and the Seventh-day Adventists have the exclusive weight of evidence on their side, whilst the biblical Protestants has not a word of remonstrance. The Adventists are the only body of Christians, same document, as their teacher who can find no warrant in its pages for the change of day from the seventh to the first. Hence they're called Seventh-day Adventists. And in the question box 1942... They said, the Seventh-day Adventists, Rome speaking, 
is the only consistent Protestant. So there's going to be a clash. Now, the Adventists are the only body of Christians that have the Bible as their teacher who find no warrant for this change. That's why they're called Seventh-day Adventists. And they write further, no Protestant living today has ever obeyed the command, preferring to follow the apostate church. Let the Bible decide whether Saturday or Sunday be the day enjoined. One of the two parties must be wrong. Then they proceed to give a Bible study which would put Seventh-day Adventists to shame, proving that the Sabbath of the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord and that they changed it. No wonder the Cardinal in the St. Catholic's Catholic Sentinel 1995 said, people who think that the Scripture should be the sole authority should logically become Seventh-day Adventists and keep Saturday holy. And why the editor of Mary Online, December 2003, said, the challenge issued by Rome over a hundred years ago in that article remains. Either the Catholic Church is right or the Seventh-day Adventists are right. There can be no other choice. How many groups? Two. The whole world in unity with one group and another group which they have defined here by their own mouth as the Seventh-day Adventists. There are only two worldwide Christian denominations. The one is Rome, the other one is the Seventh-day Adventists. And the Bible tells us, and the dragon was enraged with the woman and went to make what? War. War against the rest of her offspring, those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Well, isn't it interesting that at the vision of La Salette, 1846, isn't it fascinating, 1846, the Adventist church had just as a fledgling organization made its first appearance. It wasn't even the Adventist church yet. It says, Lucifer was unleashed in 1864. The Seventh-day Adventist church was officially formed in 1863. Is this purely a coincidence? What's the definition of truth? The law is truth. Thy law is truth. Psalms 119, 142. Commandments are truth. 142. The word is truth, John 17, 17. Jesus is the truth, John 14, 6. That's the pillars we stand on. Revelation, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel, salvation by grace, salvation by faith, righteousness by faith, and worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water, the seal of God, the Sabbath, memorial of his creation. The Roman Catholic Church says Genesis is nonsense. Vatican thinking evolves. Pope gives his blessing to natural selection. Two messages. Either God is what he says or he's not. At the same time, you have Freemasonry, spiritualism, theosophy, false prophets, Mormon movement, Jehovah's Witness, Christian science, and this tiny little movement, the Seventh-day Adventist, French Revolution philosophy, human rights against God's law. Communism coming up, communist manifesto started writing it in 1844, Origin of Species, the first draft, 1844, the Baha'i Baha Faith with the Baha'a'u'llah, 1844, the Seventh-day Adventist preaching, come out and be separate, the Baha'a'u'llah saying, come together, we're all one. And what do they teach? Here is the writings, go to the famous Baha'i temples, and you'll find three books there. The Bible, the Quran, and the writings of the Baha'u'llah. Let me read you just a little page here. I didn't want to pay money for this book, so I just photographed the page. <laughs> Gather ye together for the sake of God, resolve to root out that. Whatever is the source of contention amongst you, root it out. Then you will the effluence of the world's great luminary Develop the whole earth and its inhabitants become the citizens of one city and the occupants of one and the same throne. This wronged one, acronym in the occult language, ever since the early days of his life cherished none other desire but this, that we will continue to entertain no wish except this wish. There can be no doubt whatsoever that the peoples of the world of whatever race or religion derive their inspiration from one heavenly source. I'm sorry and are subjects to one God, 
I'm sorry. The difference between the ordinances under which they abide should be attributed to the varying requirements and exist, uh, discrepancies of the age in which they were revealed. All of them, except a few. Oh, thank God for those few. Which are the outcome of human perversity were ordained of God and are a reflection of His will. Arise! And armed with the power of faith, shatter to pieces the gods of your vain imaginations, the sowers of dissension amongst you. Cleave unto that which draws you together and unites you. And get rid of those that preach something else. That's the message of Baha'i. It was enforced by spiritism. It was enforced by channeled writings by the Baileys. In 1844, they found the Sinaiticus text. And since then, we have some mystery uh, omissions and changes, but interesting, she shall crush thy head instead of he. The new world religion must be based on right human relations. That's what we're waiting for. We need a worldwide uh, ecumenism. All the peoples of the world, a great United Nations alliance with all religions and subjection to the Bishop of Rome. That's the bottom line. And all the world wandered after the beast. That's what we're told. Now we're told to warn the world that we are to believe God, accept His righteousness, and prove it through our love in keeping His law. And the third angel's message says, do not accept this. Now is this going to be the final clash or is it not? Have Seventh-day Adventists been wrong or have they preached it on the button? Let's look. Pope launches crusade to save Sunday, 1998, he did that in his famous apostolic letter, Dies Domini. Sunday, the primordial feast day, and uh, it comes to us through tradition, celebration of the Lord's day. This is important. From Sunday to Sunday, we follow in the footsteps of Mary. I follow in the footsteps of Jesus. It is the day of the sun, and therefore even... After the fall of empires, she has the right to make laws. In his encyclical Rerum Novarum, we spoke about that. He spoke about Sunday rest as a worker's right. And therefore, in the circumstances of our time, we must ensure that civil legislation respects our duty to keep Sunday holy. And immediately after that encyclical, out comes ad tuendum fidum. By the way, when that encyclical in written, was written, who was the chief theologian of the Roman Catholic Church? It was Ratzinger. So who gave his approval to that document? It must have been Ratzinger. And who was the chief theologian that propagated canon law to be enforced on all Roman Catholics and those subjugated to her? Who was it? It was Ratzinger. So who wrote Ad to Endum Fidem? What does he say? by which certain norms are inserted into the code of canon law, whoever denies or places in doubt any truth that must be believed with divine and Catholic faith, they just said we must keep Sunday, or repudiates the Christian faith of a, of a whole and doesn't come to his senses after having been legitimately warned, is to be punished as a heretic. First time they used this word since the Middle Ages. And then it says over here, if you have... Don't come to your senses after having been legitimately warned is to be punished by an appropriate penalty. What was the appropriate penalty for heresy? It was death in the past. That's what it was. We order that anything decreed by us, capital letter, in our pontificate, capital letter, only God says, let us, capital letter, make man in our image, capital letter. Here's another God on earth proclaiming a law contrary to God's law. He just said, keep Sunday or you will be a heretic. And if you don't obey the system, you will be punished as a heretic. Now, which law really requires that we be punished as a heretic? Let's ask Pope John Paul II himself. Detroit News, July 7, 1998. Pope John Paul II said, quote, a person who violates the sanctity of Sunday is to be punished as a heretic. Is Adventist teaching on the button or not? Now what do they have? Apparitions. What do we have? The Word. The Word. Then April 24, 2005. That's this year. 
Interviewed on NBC, Meet the Press, Jesuit priest Ignatius Press founder Joseph Fascio said, those who rebel against the church's authentic teachings are rebelling against God. So the world will see our re so-called rebellion as a rebellion against God, but not the God of the Bible. And then at the 1995 interfaith meeting, all joined in condemning the Christian fundamentalists who abuse speech. And all present said John Paul too was by consensus the chief spiritual guide and overseer. And those who refuse to join the ecumenical movement are to be silenced as dangerous extremists full of hate. Now they've already said who they are. And the president of the United States, the best way to honor Pope John Paul II, truly one of the great men, is to take his teachings seriously, is to listen to his words and put his words into teachings and to action here in America. This is a challenge we must accept. So the two great philosophies are going to meet, and the issue is the Sabbath, whether we like it or not. And these encyclicals were written with the support of Cardinal Ratzinger, who was the chief theologian and the corrector of doctrine. How does George Bush and company feel about the present Pope? A man that serves the Lord, May 2, 2005. President and Mrs. Bush congratulate the Pope. Here is his original statement direct from the White House webpage. You can get it. And uh, he says clearly, he's a man of great wisdom and knowledge. He's a man who serves the Lord. We remember his sermon on the Pope. The wall of separation between church and state that was erected by secular humanists and other enemies of religious freedom has to come down. Those opposing our view are the new fascists, was said by Kustunia in Time magazine in 1995. And in response, U.S. News and World Report columnist Michael Barone said in May 2, 2005, we're very up to date here. If you read the headlines, you run the risk of thinking we are heading towards a theocracy. Isn't this fascinating? Haven't we preached for over 150 years that the beast out of the earth will pay homage to the first one? We see it in the headlines of the world. Brothers and sisters, the message we have preached is true. It's just a joke. Yes, it's just a joke. And it appeared in, uh, in a newspaper as a joke. Here's one of my conservative bases really going to like a constitutional amendment requiring folks to attend church on Sunday. But maybe it's a joke with a sting in it. How does the present Pope feel about Sunday? Sunday Mass should be seen as a joy. This is Catholic Online, the 12th of the 6th. 2005, Vatican City, June 13, 2005, we can't live without it, without Sunday. He tells the crowd at Angelus, Sunday Mass is not an imposition, but a joy and a need for Catholics, says Benedict 16. Here he is in his speech at Bari. Benedict has once again reaffirmed his priority for the commitment of ecumenism, unity in error. That's what ecumenism is all about. And calls for not only words, but concrete gestures. And celebrating the Pope, the Eucharist, he said, the Pope defines Sunday as a necessary instrument to leave the desert of frantic consumerism, religious indifference, and secularism, which is closed to transcendence. And about Sunday, he says, we cannot live without Sunday. Is Sunday becoming an issue, yes or no? Yes. It's becoming an issue. And people said it'll never happen. It's an issue, brothers and sisters. This is the final issue. Alice, Bailey, Alice A. Bailey said there will not be any dissociation between the universal church and the sacred lodge of true masons, the inner circle of the esoteric societies in the United Nations. It will be enforced through these bodies. And the major effect of his appearance will surely be to demonstrate in every land the effect of a spirit of inclusiveness, and those who embody the spirit of exclusiveness and separateness will stand automatically and equally revealed and all men will know them for what they are. Have they defined who it is? Yes, they've called them by name. They've said the Seventh-day Adventists are the only consistent Protestants. They base their teaching on the Bible and the Bible alone. Did they say that? Yes. And we base our teachings on tradition and apparitions, and we are calling the world to obedience to our system 
contrary to the word of God, we give you the rest day, not the creator of the universe. Did they say that? And choose. Either the Seventh-day Adventists are right or the Catholics are right. There can be no other choice. That's why I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. I have no other choice. The Lord says, do you want to go also? And I say, Lord, where must I go? You have the words of eternal life. Where must I go? If I give up the righteousness of the Lord and throw his cloak aside and, as naught and accept the righteousness of salvation by man through man as embodied in Marian doctrine, I throw away the greatest gift for which the king of the universe came to die. Peace will be impossible without the taming of fundamentalism through united religions that professes faithfulness only to the global spirituality and the health of this planet. There must be no distress over the disappearance of the old order. They're going to fight for it. Gobi says, be faithful to the Pope, be faithful to his commandments. I want to admonish all of us, be faithful to Jesus, be faithful to his law. Yes. Dwal Kul, this is the one who channeled through Alice A. Bailey. Jesus was wrong about the dividing of the sheep and the goats. He has been thought that the sheep went to heaven and the goats went to hell. It's the other way around. The goats in Capricorn is the in initiate. And from a certain esoteric angle, the goats go to heaven because they function in the spiritual kingdom. The sheep remain on earth until they become goats. And these are the writings which the United Nations has said form the basis of their curriculum, their world core curriculum. Looking below the seething surface of the outer events, we become aware of the spreading move towards the elimination of sectarian separateness. Are they going to want to get rid of it, yes or no? Yes. yes. And an increasing distaste for reliance on hard and fast doctrine and dogma. Away with these people that come with the Bible and say so and so and so. Brothers and sisters, I'm not trying to invoke fear in you. This is the moment we've been waiting for. Amen. This is not a time to be afraid. This is a time to stand for Jesus. Amen. This is a time when we say, Lord, they are trampling upon your righteousness. They are counting your cloak of righteousness for which you paid such a heavy price. If or not, they're throwing it aside. They are usurping your authority and say to away with it. We want no such thing. We want unity. Oh Lord, I don't want that unity. I want unity in truth and righteousness. And may the Lord help us as we ponder these things. A growing number of people are sponsoring a backlash against the wave of religious fundamentalism. The right course is to take is that which will lead the new world of unity and world law. Away with God's law. Thus the expressed aims and efforts of the United Nations will eventually be brought to fruition and a new church of God. I like the old one. Gathered out of all religions and spiritual groups will unitedly bring to an end the great heresy of separateness. This is the writing of Alice A. Bailey, the hub of the United Nations. John 16, 2, they shall put you out of the synagogues. The time cometh that whoever kills you will think that they're doing God a service. These things have I spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Not one hair on your head will be touched. Not one hair. He who said a thousand will fall by your side and ten thousand by your right hand, it will not come near you is the same who spoke the world into existence. He's the one who hung on that cross and died for us. There is nothing, brothers and sisters, to be afraid of. This world is heading for the very calamity which we have been preaching under so much ridicule for over 150 years. All I can say is, come Lord Jesus, come. Either the Catholic Church is right or the Seventh-day Adventists are right. There can be no other choice. You know, I used to preach this and say it'll come to that and I used to be laughed at. No, I don't preach it. I don't say it will happen. I just quote it. It's such a blessing. 
Thank you for writing that for me. Behold, he comes with the clouds and every eye shall see him. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. I would like to make an appeal. I would like to say it is not fanaticism to stand for righteousness and truth. It is not fanaticism to preach the three angels' messages to call a people into obedience to the king of the universe. And it's not fanaticism to say, I want no other cloak but the righteousness of Jesus. And brothers and sisters, we have been neglecting the three angels' messages and we have been sacrificing the three angels' messages on the altar of unity. I want unity. I love unity. God wants unity. But unity in truth, not unity in error. So as we come to the end of this camp meeting, may I appeal to you to go back to your roots, to come closer to Jesus than you've ever been before, and to be as lights unto the world so that many will say, who are these people that stand upon the word no matter what? Who are these people that lift up the righteousness of Jesus Christ and say it is a transcript of his character that he wants to impart and impute to us? Who are these people that are saying, I'd rather die than turn my back upon Jesus? May the Lord bless you and keep you as we go towards these very times that have been predicted since we started preaching. Amen.